Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Mash and Drum Whiskey Room. I am Jason C. Thanks for coming by. Uh, today, we have a really special episode. Uh, this is the third episode in my series called Off the Still, where we get to talk to some, um, some really, really cool people in the uh, bourbon and whiskey world. Today, uh, my special guests are Andy and Charlie Nelson. Uh, I guess you could call them uh, the new owners and also the resurrectors of the Greenbrier Distillery in Nashville, Tennessee. Say hi, guys. Hey there. How's it going? <laughs> Thanks for coming on. How are we doing? Doing great. Damn, good. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I guess uh, to get started, as you can see, I have a lot of your Bell Me products here, which I absolutely love. Uh, <laughs> your uh, your Cast Strength Reserve Bourbon was uh, in my top five bourbons of the year last year. I absolutely love that stuff. We've got that some, yeah, we've some got of that here in front of us too. So if you want to, yeah, oh, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great minds. <laughs> Um, so I guess before we get started, uh, why don't you kind of just tell us about yourselves and your roles in uh, the Greenbrier Nelson Distillery as, as of today? Yeah, well, so uh, I, I'm Andy, um, and I am the head of I'm the head distiller, head of production and operations. So I run the kind of distillery production floor and all that kind of thing. And then, yeah, and I'm Charlie, and I'm kind of the head of sales and marketing. So um, I'm sort of out in the market a lot more and, and doing a, a fair amount of events and um, that sort of thing. So. Yeah, I make it, he sells it. Yeah. I sell oh, that's, it. That, that's, that's a wonderful yeah. partnership, boys. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, to kind of go back to the history, uh, one thing when I was, uh, you know, reading about the distillery and, you know, how you guys kind of resurrected it, uh, there was a story that popped up that I read a couple times. Uh, that's saying in in 2006, uh, you guys you were invited by your dad to uh, go on a trip to Greenbrier, Tennessee. You discover your great 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 grandfather Charles uh, Charles Nelson's distillery. Um, what was that experience like, and kind of seeing that I guess that site for the first time, and and then what was it that kind of clicked in your head that said, oh, oh we we got to do this? Uh, it, man, well, it was it wasn't it was kind of nothing and everything all at once that clicked in our head saying that we've got to do this. But, but really the impetus, if you had to boil it down to one specific thing, it was these original bottles of Greenbrier Tennessee whiskey with our name on it that we saw at the Greenbrier Historical Society. But, you know, going back before that, that just going there, you know, when dad invited us to go up there to, you know, he had gone in with some buddies to buy a cow worth of meat from this butcher in Greenbrier. And we said, oh, well, We'll try that out. I mean, we knew very little. I think I knew, a, I remembered a little more than Charlie did because uh, I'm a little older than Charlie. And so I guess I was at some point old enough to like retain some far off knowledge of one time dad had mentioned this potential whiskey making history thing. Uh, but we knew almost nothing about it, <clears throat> only that maybe it was in the town of Greenbrier, but we didn't know where Greenbrier was you know, or how big the, the distillery was or anything like that. And so anyway, we got up there and it was just kind of this somewhat surreal moment um, that lasted, you know, an hour or two probably. And uh, just kind of looked at all this stuff and was like, oh my God, this is, this is a real thing. And this is obviously much bigger than we had ever thought of or imagined or considered. So um, yeah, then we went over to the historical society sold those two bottles and it was just like, all right, well, this is what we got to do. There really wasn't even a second thought or even any, as far as I remember, there were, there was no time for pondering or consider. It was just like, this is it. Here we go. <laughs> well, you, you know, you mentioned that curator that had those two original bottles. Did you guys get to taste it at all? You just got to just kind of see it. Uh, no. So the, the bottles were, were, I mean, there was like a little bit left in one of the bottles and like a bunch of like cork parts and, you know, pieces. And so uh, we have since found uh, a bunch more original bottles. So we've got probably around 40 or so original bottles. A handful of them are full. We've got like some old rye from 1899 that's 126 proof. Wow. And we've got like that's two incredible. full bottles of that. That's incredible. We, yeah, yeah. Uh, we've got a few full bottles of the Tennessee whiskey. Um, we've got a half full bottle of apple brandy. We've got a few bottles full of Angelica wine. Um, so we, we've got a... a, a you know, variety of some different stuff. And back in the day, Charles Nelson produced about 30 different labels. 
Yeah. So we've got a, a handful of those. Um, most are, are empty, but, uh, but yeah, we, we haven't actually tasted any of the Tennessee whiskey yet. We've been, we're, I don't know, we're waiting for just like the perfect moment to, or something. <laughs> uh, and we also, uh, we're a little bit worried that maybe the old, old glass could have had like lead in it or something. Uh, I don't, Andy, didn't you? I, I mean, that was a thought that I'd had. I have talked to glass uh, vendors and, and makers, and they seem to think that maybe there isn't. They yeah. didn't think that. I don't know. It's just kind of one of those things. It's like there's that mystery and the intrigue to it, and I, I almost don't want. It's like it's almost more. I don't know. It's almost more interesting not knowing in some ways, and so that <laughs> that's really kind of. Man, I, I don't. I don't know if I could be as restrained as you guys. If I grab <laughs> a bottle from that old, I'd be like, "Yeah, let me have it. I don't care what's yeah. in it." <laughs> yeah. Well, we we tasted so we tasted some of the Angelica wine. Yeah. But one of the main reasons why we tasted that one in particular is because the bottle was so easy to open, um, oh, okay. without like damaging any of the you know closure so, or getting yeah. like a bunch of cork particles in there. Um, so that's that's been another concern. We did get um, what do you call those things uh, like the Coravin? Coravin, yeah, yeah. For opening, you know what that is? It's the yeah. the wine thing to just open it. Whatever, okay. Yeah, it's like get extract it. some, yeah, without without opening the cork. Yeah, right. get, yeah, get it out of there without actually you know piercing the bottle or getting it you know opening it. Yeah. Um, well. I mean, that brings up an interesting question because you guys, you know, you found all these historic bottles and then you kind of, like you said, it was it, it was a quick decision and a long decision at the same time. Um, you decided to reopen the distillery under the Greenbrier name. Um, you know, a lot of people have different experiences when they decide to open a distillery. Uh, you guys are doing it based on, you know, your family's history. And, you know, that's that's super important. I know that's a lot of the passion that goes into you know, making whiskey, especially something so historic. Uh, what was that process like for you guys? I mean, I'm sure it was stressful yet extremely, um, you know, gratifying at the same time once it was all said and done. For sure. Um, I'll take this one. Yeah. Um, yeah. So like Andy said, you know, when, when we discovered those old bottles, it was just like, this is what we're put here on earth to do. So we, we didn't really even have to make a decision. It was just like, this is what, our lives are meant an, an understood course. thing. Yeah. And yeah. Um, at the time, you know, we knew of maybe a dozen distilleries max in the country making whiskey. And I mean, I think that's about all the distilleries there were in the U S making whiskey at the time in 2006. Um, and you know, this, there were no like small craft distilleries that we knew of, I guess like Pritchard's had, started recently and but we didn't um, know much about them yeah and, and we didn't know about uh, uh oh my gosh i'm totally like saint george's but anyway um so we spent a couple years going around to pretty much all the big distilleries meeting people who were you know running the shows there uh just learning about the industry learning about the process how to you know talking to the folks at vendome and and you know trying to figure out what all the equipment we need was. And, you know, our plan originally was to build a, you know, what we would consider today as a pretty big distillery. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, then we also spent a good bit of time in state and county archives, learning about the history of our own distillery and, and, you know, uh, discovered Bell Mead that it was one of the 30 labels that Charles Nelson produced and everything. And, um, and we found that, you know, the distillery was not just, you know, a small little craft distillery. It was one of the largest in the country prior to Prohibition, by far the largest in Tennessee. So um, we set out, you know, built a business plan, tried to raise a bunch of money. Nobody would invest. And, um, you know, banging our heads against a wall and, you know, living with my parents off of ramen noodles and peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Was <laughs> fun. Yes. Uh, okay. Back to like the college days. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. You know, mix things up. Maybe like, I've, well, I don't even want to tell you some <laughs> stuff that I would eat to try and survive. But, um, 
But anyway, uh, in you know doing that research, like I said, we found that Charles Nelson produced Bell Mead in conjunction with another company. So um, we met and, and befriended Dave Pickerel um, and sort of signed him up. And he helped us realize that we didn't have to build a multi-million dollar facility in order to get our you know foot in the game. Um, so that's when we and our parents put up literally everything that we owned to personally guarantee a loan to get started sourcing barrels, working with the contract distillery and everything to produce our own unique uh, co-mingling for Bell Mead. Then once we were able to put out a product in March of 2012, uh, then all of a sudden, like, you know, because investors have been asking, like, how do you know you can make a decent product? How do you know you can sell a product? How do you know you can run a business? How do you know, like, all these questions that we were just like, just trust us. Come on. Yeah. You're trust. like, listen, listen, it's it's in our blood. Let's let us do it. <laughs> yeah. Have you heard the story? Yeah. 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 Do you know our history? Come yeah. on. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Um, but so once once we were able to actually have a decent product out there, then raising money and everything became a, a little bit easier. We were able to raise enough money to build out our own distillery, start you know producing some on our own, and um, yeah. Then uh, now you know our our plan is eventually to to build another much larger facility, and um, you know our our goal long term is to take all production in house if possible. That's amazing, guys. Uh, yeah, all so much. Uh, I have so much respect for, you know, you know, guys like you that will decide to kind of grab the bull by the horns and do everything on their own. Obviously, I know you had to source at first, but you guys are in production, uh, you know, for making everything in house, which is always the goal. Um, yeah. You mentioned producing uh, Bell Mead and being one of about 30 labels that you're that you're that was in your family uh, lineage. What what prompted you guys to choose Bell Mead as kind of the label to go with? Um, it was kind of the thing. It, it just worked out well. So we we found out that Bell Mead had a tie to uh, the Bell Mead Mansion here in town, which mm -hmm. back in the day was a thoroughbred horse racing farm. Uh, and yeah, I have some questions about the original label for Bell Mead. <laughs> sure. Yeah, we can, we got some answers. <laughs> uh, maybe some stories too. Yeah, but, okay. um, so we, we found it out and that it was originally produced also in conjunction with a third party distillery. And that was really the key to it was that Charles Nelson himself never actually distilled Bellamy bourbon. And so if our goal was kind of fall in line with the history of what Charles Nelson did back in his day, mm -hmm. it was kind of the perfect brand to do it with. Because if we can't, if we can't build our own distillery initially, uh, and even if we had someone else, you know, creating our mash bill and recipe from their distillery, that that doesn't change the fact that we still have to wait for six, eight, however many years before our product comes of age. And so it, again, everything just kind of fell in place and that, in that way, we just learn a little more and realize, Hey, this, this would be perfect. If we want to get started, you know, we can start with already aged whiskey from a third party distillery, you know, maybe make a blend and put some recipes together to create a, a unique flavor profile. Um, as our Bell Mead, that, that's the way he did it back then as well. So it was like, all right, well, that's, I feel pretty comfortable doing that. Yeah. That's, that's kind of an interesting, um, you know, almost a reflection of what he did and what you guys are doing, you know, from yeah. all the way back when to what you guys are doing now. How was that, how was that process for you in creating that proprietary blend for Bell Mead? It was fun. I mean, it was, it was very illuminating. We learned a lot um, in terms of both sort of the magic spirit of whiskey, uh, pun fully intended, and <laughs> uh, and also just about our own palates and how uh, it was a huge crash course and kind of like just teaching ourselves how to focus and taste a whiskey and, and understand the nuances that are important if you're making it uh, and that kind of thing. And so that's where we learned that uh, I have a much better palate than Charlie. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> And everything like that, but it was it was a lot of fun. But it, and we we also learned the um, the how how just tasting doing a, a tasting of several different bottles can can quickly become dangerous, or <laughs> at least maybe not. Well, it can become dangerous for sure. But for us, it was more just like you 
pretty quickly get your palate fatigued and you can't taste anything anymore. So oh, yeah, you, know, you can you only have a, a little bit at a time, and especially when you're especially when you're tasting new make constantly. Yeah, yeah. Well, we were at that time actually we were tasting aged spirit, and I mean we tasted barrels between you know two and about eleven years old at that time. Wow, uh, yeah. so it's kind of a, a lot of understanding what the barrel does over time and and what yeast strains do and and all that kind of stuff. And yeah, after you know trying to power through twenty barrel samples on one morning. <laughs> you know, like 10 a.m. The, bre the breakfast of champions. Yeah, yeah. And also, it was pretty interesting because, like, we actually had a broker come to our parents' house to, like, you know, with different samples and everything, which that would not happen today. Like, just yeah. to give you an idea of where the market was back then, you know. Traveling uh, salesman with his briefcase full of whiskey. Yeah. Like the old door to door <laughs> physician. Uh, I want that briefcase. Jeez. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, you, you had mentioned uh, working with, uh, well, your family back then working with, uh, you know, other distillers to create Bell Mead. Uh, was that where the Sperry Wade family came in? Yeah. So the Sperry Wade and company was instrumental in the founding of the Bell Mead Mansion. They were also, they owned the Bell Mead Distillery. And so they, our understanding is that they distilled Bell Mead and then Charles Nelson aged and bottled it. Okay, um, but you got, but you guys actually went out of your way and got them involved in the process of the new Bell Mead. Is that is that correct? Yeah, yeah. So Alton Wade Kelly is a descendant. His, I believe it's his great great grandfather uh, Watson Wade, um, who uh, worked with uh, Charles Nelson. Our triple great grandfather. So, uh, so, so he would. So, were they involved in kind of coming up with the uh, flavor profile for Bell Mead a little bit? I think they just kind of trusted us to do it. They knew that it. And in fact, I honestly don't remember. It may have been that we came up with a flavor profile before we got them involved. I don't. God, that's so fuzzy. Yeah. I mean, that was like what was that? Two thousand ten or eleven? I guess mm -hmm. it was a long time ago. Um, yeah, but I mean, I just, think, I just think it's really cool that you guys would reach out to them and kind of let them know what's going on, being involved, and you know, being that their family lineage was so involved in creating Bell Mead, you know, way back when. So, yeah, it was kind of, I, I don't think we really saw any other way. It would just been, it just wouldn't have been appropriate to do this and not have them involved. Yeah. Well, well, speaking of your flavor profile, before we get into some more questions, let's get into, uh, let's get into your bourbon. All right. Um, so we are sipping on uh, Bell Mead uh, Cast Strength Reserve. Uh, my bottle happens to be 114.9 proof, uh, batch nine, bottle number 186. All right, uh, this is batch 21, bottle number 49, 114.3 proof. 114, oh wow, we're pretty close. What proof was yours? Uh, 114.9. Oh, wow. Ours, yeah, 114.3. Okay, cool. Yeah, wow. yeah very close. Um, as I mentioned to you guys, this uh, this Bell Mead Cast Strength Reserve was uh, in my top five bourbons of the year last year. Um, I absolutely love this stuff. I was really impressed with it. I love a high rye bourbon, and you guys definitely bring that uh, to the to the party here. Um my my favorite note that I always get whenever I open a Bell Mead Cast Strength Reserve is this um, this cherry cinnamon note that that kind of gets kind of coated with caramel here, and I I absolutely love it. Me too. <laughs> Me three. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes a little too much. Sometimes a little too much. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Hey, cheers! Cheers! cheers, about cheers. It. Hey, cheers, cheers. Say cheers, guys. <laughs> diving in. We don't even say anything. <laughs> I think one of my favorite parts about this reserve is that it's, you know, it, it kind of hits a lot of the, the points of interest in terms of like, uh, it's similar to a single barrel offering in that, you know, each batch is going to be a little different. It's a cast strength as well, but, you know, there's enough variation so that each batch has its own unique identity. And, uh, it's also, it may be my favorite label, physical label design that we have. I love it. But um, 
Yeah, but it's just so um, black label is pretty. It's pretty badass. I like it, and it's like the the proof. So you know, each batch being different, but the proofs are still fairly high. But they all come out like you would never know that they're as high proof as they are if you just tasted it blind. I think that's just a testament to the quality of whiskey. It's it's really delicious. Um, it it gives you a good finish too, but. It's not a burn like an alcohol. You need a uh, regular bourbon, yeah. uh, which I have here. Uh, your straight bourbon whiskey. You have your cast strength reserve. Then you have the three finished ones, which is yeah. Madeira, Madeira, Cognac, and Sherry. So I guess out of that core range, what do you what do you like the most? Man, I, I'm going to give what may sound like Just a cop out. Yeah, one. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I drink the classic the most. Um, yeah. So that partially because that's the most widely available and it's the most versatile. So like, I mean, I, whenever I like go out and go to a bar and if they've only got the classic and I drink it neat, I'm always just like, golly, this is so good. Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I mean, I, I don't know why I'm like shocked. Sometimes I'm just like, God. but I, I just love it. And um, I mean, I like the others, like the reserve, you know, is great for after a long day of work, you know, get home, pour yourself just like one glass. You know, if I'm just going to have one or, or maybe two, uh, <laughs> then so have some cast rank goodness, which will yeah. be your long yeah. day. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But then like, I love having the cognac cast before a meal with like cheese. He's literally going to go through every single one. <laughs> <laughs> I have, I, have, I have my sherry. I have my sherry finish one with some pop tarts. Yeah. <laughs> I'm all set. Actually, I think that is a pretty good pairing. You know? <laughs> my favorite pop tarts, though. No, I, I classic. I actually, I, I love the sherry cask with uh, oysters, and I love it with dark chocolate. And then the Madeira cask, I love just with like everything. So I consider the cognac like appetizer, Madeira cask, entree, sherry, dessert. Wow, you, I I feel like you you think a lot in terms of uh, food and pairings. <laughs> I you know I I spend a lot of time in bars and restaurants. So, <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I, makes sense. I, makes sense. Well, yeah. that actually that actually brings me uh, to my next question, which is um, once you guys had figured out your proprietary blend for Belmead, your bourbon, uh, the cast reserve, what prompted you to do those three finishes? How what was that process like? What what kind of triggered you to do those three specific ones? It, uh, the sherry was the first one that we did. So the sherry was that was the second product that we released after the classic. Um, and our, so James Hensley, who's our director of operations, he's, who's our first ever employee outside of the two of us. Mm -hmm. Um, and he has, he had a lot more, um, maybe, I don't know if I'd say drinking experience, but at least hospitality experience, I will say, and working behind bars and in restaurants and in liquor stores, et cetera. Anyway, so we were trying to figure out what, we wanna do something else now, you know, we wanna to add to this. How do we kind of make it more unique? And, you know, of course we had the limitation of working with, you know, third party contract distilled spirit. Uh, and so we, it's not like we could just come up with, you know, a new recipe and, because also whiskey just has to age for so long. And so we figured, all right, the idea came that a lot of Scotch whiskeys will finish or age completely in, in sherry casks. And that's kind of an interesting idea. And so we just said, all right, let's run with it. The word sherry sounds good. It's appealing. Uh, and so, <laughs> yeah. you know, and that that's worth something when you're in an R and D phase, you know? So we, um, we just tried it out. We tried the different types of sherry. We tried Oloroso, which obviously we ended up sticking with. We tried uh, Fino. I think we tried some PX. Uh, I think it was those three. Amontillado? Maybe we tried Amontillado as well. And it, and we tried some other stuff other than sherry as well. But um, the shit, well, the sherry just stuck the most in, in this first because we were like, this seems like the most surefire hit, you know, for now. It's like we're so early in our. Uh, you know, in our time as a, as a company and a brand and all that. So it was like, and, and by the way, uh, the Sherry to this day is still my personal favorite of our core, our core set. Oh, cool. That was going to be, that was going to be my next question. And I got to, mm -hmm. I got to tell you the, um, 
the select casts that you guys create uh, with the different finishes that come in at cast strength are probably some of my favorite bottles on the market when, when I'm able to find one. Um, Man, um, my favorite happens to be the cognac, the the um, the XO. That yeah. stuff, that stuff is, it's like candy. It's it's yeah. definitely it's definitely dessert, and the the cognac I think provides a really beautiful a nuttiness characteristic to the bourbon that plays so well with your recipe. It's it's really delicious bourbon. The cognac and sherry. I, I mean the cognac and Madeira. Sorry, I was kind of like going back and forth between. <laughs> Um, so we we did um, a handful of those select casks for just for like a state. So like California, for example, I just got back from California late last night. And uh, yeah. while I was there, I, I was at a bar in Berkeley and um, they had the California select cask single barrel. And I, I mean, I remember tasting it a while ago, but then when I tried that, I was just like, golly, this is so delicious i had to have two the the cool thing is with the cask finishes also i feel like they they are a little they kind of mellow out in you know in all in a fully positive way at, with some time sitting in you know in the bottle oh yeah i would i would totally agree with that absolutely yeah, yeah. it's you know it's a simple it's like I, I know like brandy producers for example will often you know, let their brandy just sit before bottling. They'll let it sit, and if they'll mingle two tanks together or casks or whatever, they'll let that, and they'll give it three or six months to just sit in a tank before they even bottle it. Um, and I think it's a similar thing. It just kind of all the flavors really meld together and become one more cohesive unit. Um, yeah, I feel like the more air gets into the bottle, uh, it, it's always kind of the same thing. You know, when you have a finished whiskey, it's usually you get a really big punch of sweetness right up front you get that, that like the most impact i feel from uh from the finishing process your first couple pours then as you work your way down then everything starts just getting a little bit better all the bourbon flavors start taking off and you get kind of like this perfect commingling of everything mm -hmm. um yeah i yeah absolutely love it i think it actually puts you guys in a really cool unique category for uh, having these finished uh, bourbons as well uh what have you what have you found has been kind of the most impact from you know these three finishing uh these three finished type bourbons is it is it uh kind of more of the like on the sales side uh is it more on the side of people are enjoying the the finished product or is it just a mix of everything it's a little it's kind of a mix of everything i mean the reserve has been very very popular but in terms of just the cask finishes yeah um, it's it's really interesting to see kind of to me i know that like every city or state that i go into you know, has its own unique identity as well. And the community, particularly of bartenders in any case, because that's like when we'll go to a city, we'll hang out in the bars and talk to the bartenders first. And so it's really interesting. I know like San Francisco, for example, the Bay Area, the sherry cask is the one that they really, really identify with or, or reach for. Uh, I believe it was Denver that loves the Madeira cask. Uh, and it, it's just so interesting seeing each place and each place with its own identity choose like which which cask finish kind of uh, fits that the identity yeah. of that city. Yeah, 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 the Madeira, yeah. yeah, the Madeira, the Madeira uh, one as well is one of those. Um, I don't think enough people have tried it to appreciate how really yeah. that one is too. I agree. It also has the smallest, the, physically the smallest casks, and so there's yeah. not as much of that out there. And it, it, I love it because, like, if you if you have a hundred people taste all three of the cask finishes, it, it's going to be a pretty even spread. I would bet that it would be probably about forty would say sherry cask was their mm -hmm. favorite, and then like thirty and thirty cognac and Madeira. Yeah. I, and the one thing, and you know, this is where you can really tell the quality of a distillery, at least in my eyes, is you could have a finished whiskey or a finished bourbon, but you could still taste you know, your core recipe and your core flavor profile underneath all that. So I think you guys do with all your finishes, you do a really masterful job at that. So um, I guess, I guess I'll give the nod to, uh, to Andy on that one. Right. Yeah. You hear that? <laughs> yeah. I got, I got nothing to do with anything around here. All I do is go to the bars. Yeah. And he's like, you hear that? Charlie's like, well, I just drink it. So I'm okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, actually that brings us to uh, another. So your special releases, have been some of the most coveted bottles 
you know that that you hear about, uh, including your your bell mead, your honey cask finish, your uh, your honey barrel, the uh, the the black bell that was finished in stout barrels, um, and then your recent your recent um, release, which was I don't even know how, how do you pronounce that the Malvedra? yeah the Malvedra. yeah very good <laughs> that's pretty good yeah not bad so um, yeah tell tell us about that process and how are you guys coming up with these uh, these really not only experimental, but highly successful type releases. I mean, the, are, I mean, are you just kind of thinking like, oh, this this would our whiskey would pretty much taste good in this, and let's try it in this, and let's try it in this, and yeah. um, you know, it goes. How's that process like? We have to have a reason behind just about everything. Of course, of course, yeah. you know. And so, um, it it has to there has to be a good reason behind, it, and it has to you know obviously taste really good. So we'll do some experimenting before. Um, but like the Movedra cask, for example, uh, the owner of the Withers Winery is a good friend of ours, and he has been a big fan of Bell Mead, and we've been a big fan of his wine. And so, you know, he was like, look, I want to do a collaboration with you guys. And we're like, cool, we'd like to collaborate with you. And, um, <laughs> well, well, before you go further, what can you just explain to the viewers, what kind of wine is Movedra? Okay. Do you want to? Well, sure. I mean... Yeah, honestly, like neither of us, I think, know as much about wine. Uh, well, either either do I. So I was hoping you guys would know. Movedra Mo is like it, it's it's uh, more commonly known as like a a small amount that gets blended into a French blend, like a GSM Grenache Syrah Movedra. Okay. Um, and then Andrew Tao from uh, Withers Winery, he. I was like, okay, I want to kind of flip that on its head a little bit and do something a little bit different and, and you know, come out with a wine that is primarily Movedra. So, uh, and then we were talking, he was like, okay, I think that this wine would work pretty well with your high rye content. Um, and so we just played around with it, put it, some in a barrel and, you know, then took out some samples and we we're like, holy cow, this is delicious. And let's bottle it and sell it. And yeah. that was actually the first one, I think, in our Craftsman Cats collection. That maybe, well, uh, or well, the Black Bell well, was, yeah. was before we, that book. Yeah, yeah, that's right. But um, it's, in terms of all of them, um, like Charlie said, there's gotta be a reason behind it. And sometimes yeah. that reason is not known to us until the idea hits us. In other words, like for the honey cask, for example, you know, we just were were asked by True Bee Honey if, you know, they're doing a barrel aged honey and they ask us for a used bourbon barrel. We said, sure. And we didn't even, at that point, hadn't even thought anything else of it. We said, sure, we'll give you a, a barrel. And then, uh, however long later after they did it, they reached back out and said, do you want this barrel back? And it like right then it was like, oh, yes, as a matter of fact, we do. <laughs> what an interesting idea. Because, I mean, it's raw, natural honey. It's, you know, and that's all that there is to it. And so that in itself is also an especially cool experience kind of seeing, uh, you know, after that and, and even a little bit before that, I had actually become kind of obsessed with, uh, with bees and honey making and beehives uh, and just that, the entire ecosystem of a, of a beehive. Um, and so that was just like something that immediately popped to me. And, you know, of course that worked quite well too. And it, it happened to be that, you know, plenty of other brands are coming out with, you know, honey flavored, you know, whiskeys and there's kind of like cinnamon and honey. Uh, and so honey was being very popular, but this is, <laughs> does that, does that, mean, does that mean there's a bell meat fireball in your future? <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't know about that. <laughs> But yeah. uh, but the honey just worked out well, and it tasted fantastic, and it was actually just a lot simpler than even trying to do a, you know, honey flavored anything. It just was like this is the real way to do it. And yeah, that was the most interesting thing about it. When I found out it wasn't a because initially when you kind of first hear about it, you think, oh, it's a it's a honey flavored you know bourbon or honey flavored whiskey, but that's not the case at all. Right, you're taking barrel uh, honey that was finished in a barrel and finishing your whiskey in it. Yeah, um, it's it's a it's totally a uh, I don't know if a microcosm is but a smaller example uh, of 
sort of an analogous notion of the entire story of our of our history and how our company exists because i know that i've seen people who don't know anything about what we're doing or anything they just say oh you know these two guys putting a bunch of marketing stuff out there whatever it's just a dime a dozen and you know that's fine they just don't know what the reality is and so that's that so to your point it's like it may just seem like that but you got to hear the history and understand you know the reason for its being to to fully appreciate it yeah um, yeah how long did your bourbon stay in the in the uh the honey cask for uh gosh we've done a couple different ones and they're typically between i want to say two and three months not even maybe just closer to two i think the first time was maybe only like five weeks or something like that uh and it's interesting because uh, what is honey is uh what's the term it's uh hygroscopic meaning that it attracts uh moisture mm -hmm. and so that oh, that's what i was going to get to before was that when when we got the barrel back from the honey producer uh it was it was really really dry and so the seams in between the staves were just all opened up and it like it could not hold water or whiskey. And so what we had to do was hydrate the barrel from the outside with, you know, just with clean water to sort of re uh, sort of waterlog the barrel because that's what makes the wood self sealing in mm -hmm. a barrel. And so or else we didn't have a bunch of whiskey leaking out. Right. And so oh, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Absolutely. Yeah. And so that was just really a fascinating thing, but it, you know, it as, is one of the properties of honey. That's something we didn't know, but it's like, there's a lot of maintenance that goes into that barrel, you know, to make sure that it doesn't leak and just lose everything. Yeah, and your your labor of love definitely turned out to be uh, one of the most coveted bottles. I mean, it's, I, I only got to ever have one little sample of it. I got a one ounce sample from a buddy of mine. And uh, it was so unique to me because it, you, you would think, okay, honey, bourbon, you take a sip of this stuff and then you're waiting for the honey characteristic to kind of hit your palate, but it's not until the finish where you get this sweet, raw honey characteristic to it. And I think that was kind of the beauty of it because it's not like this super overly sweet bourbon, you think, oh, honey characteristic, but then um, really to me, like right, like mid to back palate is really when you get those honey, this light, like this slight, if you've ever had raw honey before, it has a bite to it, almost like there's pepper in it. And that's what I feel like you get in the uh, in that bourbon. It's amazing stuff. Yeah, and it was just uh, it was raw wildflower honey, so yeah. not any specific flower or plant that the honey came from. But I'll sit here and talk about weird honey too for as long as you <laughs> want to. But, but it, that was the other thing. It was like a a fairly, if you can call it, straightforward or standard honey sort of flavor profile, as opposed to like a, I don't know. There's some weird, super spicy weird honeys out there one of the batches of the honey cask i thought taste had like semi-pronounced notes of coffee oh that's interesting that might have just been me i don't know <laughs> beauty of tasting whiskey there's no wrong answers <clears throat> yeah i mean it's whatever kind of uh <clears throat> i always i always feel like uh you know bourbon or whiskey can always bring you back uh you know to, to something that's a reminder so there's really no wrong yeah. answers it's whatever you know kind of clicks for you um totally all right, so uh, I guess we'll do some fun questions real quick because I always like to ask. Uh, I was like to ask my guy a couple of fun questions, especially got you guys being in the in the whiskey world. Uh, so for each of you, what is your favorite cocktail? Uh, my personal favorite. Well, shoot, God, now I'm going to give a cop out answer. So my single personal favorite is the Vucare, um, specifically from the Carousel Bar uh, at Hotel Monteleone in New Orleans, where it was invented. However. I can basically, I can only drink one at a time because they're real sweet, but I have a big time sweet tooth. So I love it for one. Yeah. And beyond that, probably a, a Boulevardier. Oh, okay. What about you? What about you, Charlie? I mean, I'm just a good old fashioned. Or just I mean, a straight, uh, just a good old fashioned. Yeah. Good old I, fashioned, old fashioned. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, God, awesome. You like it heavy, you like it heavy orange or heavy cherry? Um, I mean, not really heavy either. Just 
as long as it's got you know bell mead bourbon in it then i'm gonna yeah be okay. something, something tells me as long as that old-fashioned is paired with a good meal you're okay <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> and, and good company you know yeah, of course and that's good what and that, yeah and that's what the yeah. whiskey's about absolutely yeah so. um so when you guys aren't sipping nelson greenbrier uh whiskey bell mead whiskey whatever it may be uh, are there any other brands out there that you guys like to sip on that, or is it more of a, uh, is it more for science that you're tasting different stuff? <laughs> uh, so my, I am, I really and truly, uh, I have a large, large collection of spirits at home and mm -hmm. very few bottles have any more than like one or two swigs taken out of them. I mean, I don't swig directly from the bottle all the time. Oh, don't lie. <clears throat> um, but really, I mean, I, I am so interested in, in knowing what the entire universe of, of whiskey or I love rum too. Dark rums are great. Um, told you I have a sweet tooth. So yeah, I, mean, I, I like trying everything. I mean, I, if I haven't had it before, I want to try it. And so I, I definitely do not have a single go-to. Um, but in my cocktails, I'll have bell meat, of course. But yeah, I, I just really try everything. That's awesome. What about you, Charlie? Being at uh, being the, uh, you know, making all your different stops at different bars. Uh, do people try to entice you to try anything else? Yes, a lot of different stuff. Uh, <laughs> I I particularly love agave spirits. Um, oh, okay, yeah. so mezcal, tequila, ricea, sotol, um, all all those. Um, Mez Me mezcal is has been one of my new favorite things. I'm getting into as well. Yeah. I, I love it. And I, I want to go and, and visit some distilleries in, in Mexico and everything. But, but yeah, I mean, like Andy said, I just love trying all this stuff. I mean, I, I, I think that all whiskey is, is good. Uh, some is just better. Um, and, you know, had some really good rums. Um, I've started to get into, I mean, I, I'll have a little gin every now and again. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I, my, my two favorite categories are, are, you know, going to be whiskey and, and agave spirits. Wow. Do I see, do I see an agave or rum finished bell meat in the future? We no, can neither no. confirm nor deny anything. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying, I'm just saying it, it sounds like an amazing idea. The rum with your high rye finish could, could be something pretty special boys. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, <laughs> favorite movies. Uh, mine, uh, God, mine are, oh God, I have like five favorites that all are rotating at any given moment, but yeah, they include yeah, the Big Lebowski, yeah. any Wes and well, it's like any Coen brothers or Wes Anderson movie. Uh, right. that's, those are, are really my style. So, so Big Lebowski, what else? Uh, the Royal Tenenbaums, uh, mm -hmm. is a big one. Uh, Shawshank Redemption. Oh, classic. Hell yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. All right. What about, what about you, Charlie? What are your I, uh, you got? I, your favorite genre or favorite movie? Golly, I I love like every movie, and I I I'm I can be kind of a baby when it comes to movies too. Like I mean, I I like teared up watching The Incredibles. You know, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, <laughs> this is has nothing to do with either of our things. But one time our, our production manager Goodlow was asked. Hey, uh, so what's there's someone who's joking about like your favorite foreign movie? He said, My favorite, I only watch foreign films. My favorite is The Rescuers Down Under. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was a gem. Yeah, that was a gem. Yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll take that answer. That's a good one. <laughs> but I did just see last night a pre screening of uh, The Dead Don't Die, a Jim Jarmusch movie. Uh, okay. Like, a, it's a comedy, like, zombie silly zombie movie uh and i give it a thumbs up i'd go see it whenever you're able uh, silly. some of us so yeah i love documentaries and yeah, I'm, a, I'm kind of a documentary buff too i love watching those uh documentaries about different things but i'm also a classic movie like i love pouring a good whiskey and watching like casablanca or something like that yeah yeah that was uh, when i when netflix first came out i was really getting into like some of the old school movies and yeah. like you know, Citizen Kane and, um, you know, love 
like a lot of a lot of like the French films. Um, really love A Bronx Tale was like one of the first movies that uh, Pete's Dragon was my favorite <laughs> Disney movie. <laughs> Pete, uh, yeah, Mulan. Love whiskey to Mulan. It's always Arthur good. Goes West. <laughs> All right. How about uh? How about what's your favorite? What's your favorite kind of music and band genre? What do you guys like to listen to? Rock and roll, yep. straight ahead rock and roll. Uh, you know, I, you know, whatever Led Zeppelin, ACDC, that kind of stuff. Nice. Uh, I've also, however, had been on a huge bluegrass kick recently. Um, if I got to do a bunch of work and just sit and focus, throw on some fast bluegrass and. That'll that'll get me going. Yeah, make making bourbon and uh, and listening to uh, listening to bluegrass is my kind of day. <laughs> I know. I feel yeah. like a caricature of a bourbon maker. <laughs> it's fine with me. Yeah. Um, two of my favorite albums right now are put out by Light in the Attic Records, which I based out of Seattle. They're just awesome. Um, at Country Funk Volume One and Two. Um, I could listen to those records all day. Um, and I also love some like blues and world music. Uh, just saw Rodrigo y Gabriela at the Ryman a week or two ago, which was great. And Justin Towns are all open for him, which was cool. How much you awesome, guys? Yeah. Um, yeah, just just some fun questions to kind of get you, uh, get, get a little bit off whiskey a little bit. I like to kind of find out a little bit about, uh, you know, the people that are making the whiskey uh, and marketing it. So, yeah, um, uh, I guess uh, what does I guess to kind of finish things out here, guys, what's kind of what does the future hold for for? Uh, well, actually, before we finish out, I did want to ask you, I forgot to ask you guys about um, your your Tennessee, your new Tennessee 108, the first 108 whiskey, um, which was based on, you know, the original Tennessee recipe from uh, from Nelson's Greenbrier Distillery. That had to be a pretty personal yet rewarding uh, type of creation to make. What was that process like for you guys? And were you were you really? Uh, I got to taste the 108. I guess the regular bottle, and then then I think you have a you have a single barrel as well. Mm -hmm. um, I got to taste both of those uh, quickly when I was at uh, when I when I went to Nashville and visited your distillery, and I was really impressed with both of them. What was that process like for you guys? It was, uh, it was a lot of fun because it was, you know, it was the first whiskey of our own distillate, aged whiskey of our own distillate that we released. Uh, and so that was, you know, an excitement that we had never felt before. Um, yeah. it was, it was very cool to see, you know, it's, it's smaller, it's the 30 gallon barrels and it's two year old spirit. Um, but even that was a, a big education in terms of, you know, you can hear the theory or the, the sort of hypothesis of, you know, small barrels and, and less time versus a standard 53 and, you know, four, six, eight, however long, many years. But we got to actually functionally experiment and, and experience that. And so that was really interesting. Um, and I, so now I kind of fully understand all the sides of that, of those, those theories and that argument. Um, so that was really interesting. And by the way, for what it's worth, uh, we're not going to put our name on something we're not proud of. And so we know that what we released is something that we were willing to, you know, put our name on. And so, uh, it would, I mean, whatever, I'm just going off on a tangent here, but it was, it was a ton of fun. It's very interesting and really, really rewarding, really. I mean, it was just like, here's our first whiskey, you know, the next, the four-year-old stuff will be who knows, you know, maybe it'll be more worth it. Maybe it'll just be like, uh, I think it'll be more worth it, more exciting. <laughs> you got to wait longer for it, but. Yeah, well, judging what I tasted from the two-year stuff, uh, I, I can't wait for the four-year stuff because I really thought the two-year-old, and it's always usually a testament to the quality and what you guys are producing. The two-year-old stuff, it actually, your single barrel in particular, tasted a little bit older than it was. So mm -hmm. I, think, I think that's a testament to what you guys are, are creating over there. Um, yeah. What is the what does the future hold for uh, for Nelson Greenbrier Distillery? I mean, you guys mentioned an expansion. Um, as far yeah. as as far as anything else, what 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 do you see down the line as far as you know from both sides, from marketing and also from um, 
just uh, whiskey and bourbon creation. What do you guys uh, got coming up that, you know, obviously that you can talk about? Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, it's we've made no secret of the fact that our plan has always been to take over the world. So uh, we're here to tell you that. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, I mean, we, we do want to make this um, a brand, you know, that goes nationwide and, and that we show the world kind of what we've been been waiting on here, you know, as, as Charlie had mentioned, we do have uh, plans. We'd love to build a much bigger distillery, get more things, you know, in house on our own. Um, and so we're still going to work on that. I mean, right now our focus is almost solely on, you know, the launch of the Tennessee whiskey and getting that, you know, getting that flavor profile, that blend taken care of and exactly what we want it to be. So is your expansion plan planning on, are you building on what you have already or are going to another location within Nashville? It would, you know, the idea is that we, we keep our spot here and then build an extra facility, you know, hopefully in Robertson County, somewhere with close to the original distillery. But um, the idea would be to keep this spot that we've got here in Marathon Village in downtown Nashville and, and then add it at an extra place. I was saying the, the immediate expansion is here at our current facility. Yeah, yeah. When I when I was there, I saw in the back you guys had a lot of distillation going on. So I know you guys are you're you're churning out a lot of juice each day. What what's kind of what's your production like right now? Not enough. Yeah, I mean we we <laughs> have a ton of barrels sitting back, but we're that's, you know, that's, we're doing that's, that's the marketing guy right there. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We're uh yeah we're I mean we're doing two shifts a day, seven days a week now. We could go to three shifts a day, uh, and so we also we could add another still in here or you know increase fermentation or whatever you know there's a there's any number of ways that we could increase production capacity here in this space um, but by virtue of its size and everything it's it, our physical buildings it is somewhat limited but um we can still go up further from here uh, and so uh, that's that's our plan how close are you guys to um having your own distillate be part of your bell mead line uh that's still several years away years. Yeah. yeah i mean the bell mead you could tell has some age on it and it's, it's yeah. delicious stuff so I'm, I'm really looking forward to that but uh uh i guess final question for you guys is is what um when all is said and done and you said i think you might have answered this a little bit you said you want to take over the universe or the world uh but what's kind of your when you're when you're thinking long-term goals or uh eventually let, let's 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 phrase it like this Ten years from now, what do you want Bell Mead and uh, Nelson's Greenbrier Distillery to mean to the the whiskey world? So uh, I'll take this. I guess um, you know Bell Mead was originally meant to be kind of a bridge to get us to our Greenbrier uh, Tennessee whiskey yep. and building Nelson's Greenbrier Distillery. Uh, Nelson's Greenbrier Tennessee whiskey is what we see as being like our signature product. I mean, that's something that we want to take over the world with. And, you know, we want to price it right so that like we can share our story and our product with as many people as possible. I mean, this may be unrealistic, but I'd love to get to be selling a million cases a year in, you know, 10, 15 years. That may not be possible, but I'd like to go for that. And Bell Mead, I think, um, you know, could be a nice sort of little bit more of a boutique -y type of brand where, you know, we keep going with a lot more of these like experimental, you know, finishes and, and you know, be a little bit more for the, the connoisseur and, um, you know, the person who's, you know, a little bit more than just a, a casual whiskey drinker, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and but like you know greenbrier it, we we it's it's something that is and will be good enough to just sip neat or or on the rocks but it's also like i just want people to to drink it and enjoy it and if they you know want to mix it with something or or make a cocktail that's totally cool too um and then we also want to build out like, you know, like back in the day, we had a whole portfolio of brands. We had multiple Tennessee whiskeys, multiple bourbons, corn whiskeys, rye whiskeys, a malt whiskey, apple brandy, peach brandy, Angelica wine, even gin. We actually produced one of the first American gins. So I'd love to just build out that portfolio and do as many of those 
original products as we can and just everything that we do trying to keep in line with the history of the original and yeah. not to mention oh sorry no was I, was gonna say, I was gonna say what's amazing is in a in a in an industry today where some new distilleries some crap distilleries make up stories to or try to somehow massage a story in order to sell their bourbon or whiskey you guys have an uh, an unbelievable story that goes back to pre-prohibition and i think the quality and what you guys are producing on top of that story i think you guys have something really incredible and that's you know it's really one of the reasons why i wanted to talk to you guys thank right. you yeah i mean i i will say it's fortunate for me anyway uh it would be so hard for me to kind of BS my way through a story that I knew that I knew was not like a hundred percent actually true and accurate. Um, you know, and cause obviously marketing is a big part of, of any business where you want to sell product and get it out there. Um, yeah. and we just, you know, but it is the story that we have is exactly the very reason that we exist now in the modern day. We, you know, we wouldn't have gotten into this and tried to build a brand. It was more that, the history was presented to us in such a way that it was just undeniable. So we've got to, we've got to do this rather than, Hey, let's start a distillery. And, you know, so we were just very lucky in that regard. Yeah. What's, what's uh, interesting too is Charlie was rattling off all those, uh, those, those products he wants to make. And, and he was just kind of staring into space. <laughs> God, <laughs> hey, if we've got production capacity, I would love to make all that stuff. I, I, I really would love to get, uh, get creative and get weird with some of these things. Yeah, and I ab absolutely agree with you, Charlie. I think the Nelson Greenbrier label, that history and, and that being kind of your your main product while the bell mead and your creative, your connoisseur, everything kind of supplements that. You know, I I think that's I think that's amazing and I, I really can't wait to see what uh, you know you guys have coming up in the future. Um, but you know before we sign off here, uh, I want you guys kind of tell tell everybody where to find you, whether it be social media, tell us uh, where to find you in Nashville. Yeah, uh, so we're in Nashville in the Marathon Village area, 1414 Clinton Street. Uh, you can find us online at ngbd.com or greenbriardistillery.com, also bellmeadbourbon.com, uh, social media at ngbdistillery or at bellmeadbrbn. And uh, yeah, follow us on social media, sign up for our email list. Um, that's how we announce a lot of our special stuff. So um, we're also working on uh, creating the Cooper's Club, which will be uh, for you know folks that want to get special information and access to some, some uh, special stuff before it's released to the public. So. All right, guys, and, uh, and with that, uh... I'm going to have my little sip here of the Bell Mead Cognac, which is my favorite finished one. Nice. Um, and I have, I have a little toast that I do for all my viewers. And I always say, um, it's not about the whiskey, it's the people you share it with. So cheers, guys. Cheers. cheers. Thank Take you. Care. Take care, guys.